the VTC meeting of, of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is the situation in the Middle East. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the representative of Yemen to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the following briefers to participate in this meeting. Mr. Martin Griffith, Special Envoy of the Secretary General for Yemen, and Mr. Mark Lowcock, under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. I now give the floor to Mr. Martin Griffith. Mr. Griffith, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you to the members of the Council for this uh, opportunity to brief, to brief you. An opportunity has emerged to bring peace to Yemen. This opportunity has come as a country faces some of its toughest days. Military escalations have continued on several fronts for three months. The arrival of the COVID-19 pandemic to Yemen threatens to bring deeper and more widespread suffering to the people. There cannot be a more timely moment for the two parties to commit silencing the guns and ending the conflict through a peaceful political solution. The threat of COVID-19 has galvanized the effort towards peace among Yemenis as well as the international community. On the 25th of March, the United Nations Secretary General made an urgent appeal for an immediate end to hostilities in Yemen and for the parties to focus on reaching a negotiated political settlement and doing everything possible to counter COVID-19. The government of Yemen, the government of Yemen immediately welcomed the call of the UN Secretary General, as did the leadership of Ansarallah. In addition, there was an outpouring of support from other Yemeni political leaders and civil society, including from women and youth. And I indeed have been struck by how consistent and clear the message has come across over the past several weeks from people across Yemen. They want this war to end, and they want their leaders to agree to resolve their differences through dialogue and negotiation. And to take but one example, I recently met with the Yemeni Women's Technical Advisory Group, who have a role of advising, supporting, and guiding my mission, and they were insistent to me that the war must indeed stop now, and they highlighted as possible dividends the importance of agreeing on humanitarian measures as a result, particularly on improving freedom of movement and on releasing those detained in the war. On 8th of April, the Saudi-led coalition announced a unilateral ceasefire for an initial period of two weeks. The explicit aim of this ceasefire was and is to create a conducive environment for the success of UN-led efforts, those efforts signalled by our Secretary General. I want to express my gratitude to the Coalition and the leadership of His Royal Highness Prince Mohammed bin Salman for this positive initiative. It's a clear sign of commitment to a peaceful political solution to the conflict and indeed to supporting the efforts of the United Nations to that end in Yemen. The international community has also been vocal in its support. There have been many governments in the region and indeed beyond who have helped behind the scenes in this period with timely and important advocacy to support our efforts. And I'm also grateful, Mr. President, to this Council for your continued support for the UN's efforts to put an end to this conflict. Mr. President, all eyes are now on the parties to the conflict. This is the time for hard decisions. None of us should underestimate the demands that are placed 
upon the leadership of both parties. The decisions now needed from both the two parties are of existential importance for the future of their country. And I know that both the Governor of Yemen and indeed Ansarallah want to end this conflict on the basis, naturally, of a fair and just peace. I'm grateful to them for that. And I know from all my meetings with President Hadi over the two years that I've had the privilege in this assignment that his focus is always on what is best for the future of the country. Following the call of the Secretary General, I presented proposals to the two parties. The first on a nationwide ceasefire agreement. The second on key humanitarian and economic measures, which may include releases of prisoners and detainees, opening Sana International Airport, paying civil servant salaries, opening access roads, and ensuring the entry of ships carrying essential commodities into her data ports, all of which, all of which, all these measures will help directly and indirectly in the fight against COVID-19. And my third proposal provides for the urgent resumption of the political process. Over the past two weeks or more since then, I have been in constant negotiations with the parties on the texts of these agreements, on the detail on the wording of these agreements. We expect them to agree on and formally adopt these agreements in the immediate future. The pace of these negotiations, Mr. President, has not indeed been impeded by the need to conduct them virtually. The conversations we have had with the two parties and our consultations with the Saudi-led coalition among other international actors, and they are legion, are continuous, detailed, and constructive. I can report that we're making very good progress. We are, I hope, I believe, moving towards a consensus over the proposals I have put forward, particularly, indeed, on the principle of a nationwide ceasefire, which is supported by both parties. And we are redoubling our efforts to bridge the outstanding differences in the text and in the proposals between the parties before we convene them at a meeting where, because it will be virtual, these agreements will be tabled, confirmed, I hope, and published. I'm grateful to both parties for the way in which they have conducted their negotiations with the United Nations. It's open, frank, constructive, timely, and focused. In my discussions with Mr. Abdul Malik Al Houthi, he has always communicated his desire to end this war. In addition, there is no doubt, there is no doubt that the diplomatic consensus, which is very tangible in the context of Yemen and on this particular process, and has been ably catalyzed and guided by the interventions of the United Nations Secretary General, is playing a crucial, I, do, I would say, central role in pushing all of us and both parties towards what we hope will be a successful conclusion in the near term. Mr. President, lamentably, however, military activities continue on a number of fronts, despite the many calls from Yemenis and the international community and, you, and this council for it to stop. I fear this war will continue until we get an agreement on our proposals, which include, of course, that nationwide ceasefire. Marib, the governorate of Marib, to the east of Sana'a, remains the center of gravity of this war, yet it is not the only theater. And the sooner we can stop the fighting, the better. The heavy fighting has continued, and I'm sure we'll help here in detail from Mark, to take the lives of more innocent Yemeni civilians. I would also like to call the Council's attention uh, to the senseless attack on the women's section of the central prison in Taiz City on 5th of April, which killed and injured many, including women and children. And I, along with many Yemenis and United Nations officials, condemned this horrific attack 
underlining yet again, and not for the first time, that all civilians and civilian objects, including prisons and prisoners, must be protected under international humanitarian law. In Hodeida, ceasefire violations continue on a daily basis at the same level as during my last briefing. Following the deeply regrettable shooting and serious injury of a government of Yemen liaison officer by a sniper, the Redeployment Coordination Committee and the joint mechanisms to implement the Hodeida Agreement have in effect ceased to function. And as we're all striving to maintain stability in Hodeida and achieve in parallel and as reinforcement a nationwide ceasefire, which is now in prospect, it is important, indeed it is essential, that the parties resume the work of that redeployment coordination committee uh, and that the joint mechanisms that underpin it. And I know that my colleague, General Guha, the head of the UN mission for the Hodeida Agreement is continuing his efforts in Yemen to engage with the parties to prevent any deterioration of the situation or a spillover of the escalation from other areas. Mr. President, the threat of COVID-19 in Yemen, obviously and evidently and without equivocation, requires all our attention and resources. Yemen cannot face two fronts at the same time, a war and a pandemic. And the new battle that Yemen faces in confronting the virus will be all-consuming. I know that my colleagues under Mark's leadership and in Yemen under Lise Grandi have this in prospect, and it is a prospect which frightens us. We can do no less on our side then to stop this, than stop this war and to turn all our attentions to this new threat. And we've heard the calls since we last met from Yemenis across the country asking all of us to make the virus the priority. I know that the leaders of both parties, as well as those in the region, understand this as well as anyone. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Martin, for your briefing. I now give the floor to Mr. Mark Lowcock. Thank you very much, Mr. President. On 10 April, the government of Yemen confirmed the first case of COVID-19 in the country. You've just heard from Martin how the threat of COVID-19 must galvanize the political process despite the challenges. We need a similar sense of urgency for the humanitarian crisis. More than five years of war have severely degraded Yemen's health infrastructure, exhausted people's immune systems, and increased acute vulnerabilities. As a result, epidemiologists warn that COVID-19 in Yemen could spread faster, more widely, and with deadlier consequences than in many other countries. We are, in other words, running out of time. The humanitarian coordinator, Lise Grandi, described COVID-19 in Yemen as, quote, one of the biggest threats in the past hundred years, end quote. It's in this context that I would like to update you on five priorities for humanitarian response. First, protection of civilians. Second, humanitarian access and delivery. Third, funding for the relief effort. Fourth, the Yemeni economy. And fifth, progress towards peace. COVID-19 affects all of those issues. First, protection of civilians. In the first quarter of this year, civilian casualties have risen every month, with more than 500 people killed or injured. One in every three civilian casualties has been a child. In Al Jaf, where hostilities escalated in mid-January, that rate is now one in two. Despite calls for a ceasefire, hostilities have persisted in many areas, mainly in Marib, Al Jaf, Al Baida, and Taiz, with deadly consequences for civilians. All parties must take constant care to spare civilians and civilian objects throughout military operations. 
As Martin said, on 5 April, a strike against a women's prison in Thais killed seven women and a child living with his detained mother. Another 26 women were injured. Since January, at least 60,000 people have fled conflict in Al Jaf and neighboring areas. Most of them have arrived in Marib, where more than 800,000 displaced people have sought refuge since 2016. If conflict expands deeper into Marib, and everything must be done to avoid that, more than a million people could suddenly be on the move. So I welcome the recent moves towards a nationwide ceasefire, including the coalition's declaration last week. I urge all parties to join this effort, which is urgently needed not just to give Yemen a fighting chance against COVID-19, but to relieve the disproportionate burden of the war on civilians. Mr. President, the second issue is humanitarian access, which is both a requirement of international humanitarian law and essential if we're to continue assisting millions of people. We're working with all stakeholders to take precautions to reduce the risk of COVID-19 while maintaining life-saving assistance. These precautions are not slowing down aid operations in a major way. But it is regrettable that other restrictions imposed on staff and cargo movements, mostly in the North, continue to constrain our ability to maintain the high levels of aid that Yemenis need. There are problems in government held areas as well, including bureaucratic impediments and insecurity. Humanitarian organizations are still waiting for government officials to approve 43 projects that would assist 2.3 million people. Many of these requests have been pending for months. Several organizations in the South have also experienced serious challenges in implementing approved projects in the last few weeks. We appreciate the government's stated commitment to resolve these issues. In the North, access challenges remain severe, and Sir Allah authorities have taken several steps to improve the operating environment for aid agencies, but progress is not moving fast enough. Restrictions in northern Yemen are so onerous that humanitarian agencies are being forced to calibrate programs and delivery to levels where they can manage the risks associated with such a non-permissive environment. Although Ansar Allah authorities have approved 13 aid projects since early March, agencies still have 92 requests pending, including 40 that have been waiting for months to get started. Local officials still arbitrarily refuse missions and humanitarian staff continue to experience severe movement restrictions in the field, including in the past few days. Staff are subjected to long delays at checkpoints, even when paperwork is in order. In a particularly serious event, which has not yet been resolved, UN international staff in some locations have been prevented from moving from field hubs to Sanaa. This is unacceptable. And on a separate note, there has been no progress in accessing the Safa oil tanker. Every day we're working with the authorities to address these challenges. There are positive steps. The waiver of a levy on humanitarian projects remains in place and a principal governing framework for the work of NGOs has been agreed. After months of negotiations, there's finally confirmation from the authorities that the World Food Programme's long planned biometric registration exercise can start. And despite all the challenges to maintain principal aid delivery, I want to remind everyone that the humanitarian operation remains a lifeline for millions of Yemenis. Every month, we are still helping more than 13 million people across the country. Last year, humanitarian agencies supported 3,100 health facilities and conducted 17 million medical consultations. We enabled access to clean water and sanitation for more than 11 million people and treated nearly a million acutely malnourished children. Nearly 12 million people received food assistance every month. These are the kinds of broad-based programs that are essential to help Yemenis keep healthy and defend themselves against COVID-19. But Mr. President, we need money to pay for these programs. That brings me to my third point, funding for the aid operation. Of the UN's 41 major programs, 
31 will start closing down in the next few weeks if we cannot secure additional funds. This means we will have to start eliminating many of the activities that may offer Yemenis their best chance to avoid COVID-19. UNICEF will have to stop immediate assistance for families displaced by conflict or natural disasters. That means up to a million displaced people would not receive critical supplies, including hygiene items that help protect against diseases like cholera and COVID-19. Nutrition programs will also be cut, affecting 260,000 severely malnourished children and 2 million more children with moderate malnutrition. These children's immune systems will be weakened, making them much more vulnerable to COVID-19, cholera and other diseases. People who do fall sick are likely to find fewer clinics to help them. WHO estimates that 80% of health services provided through the response could stop at the end of April. That could mean disbanding local health teams that have been essential in detecting and containing past disease outbreaks. We need these teams more than ever, not just to keep on top of COVID-19, but to contain a growing risk that cholera will rebound as the rainy season starts. The humanitarian community, UN agencies, international NGOs and others are unanimous in our position that the world's largest aid operation cannot afford extended cuts during this unprecedented emergency. The UN agencies estimate they need more than $900 million to carry them through July. So I want to thank the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for their pledge last week of $500 million for the UN-led response and $25 million for COVID-19 activities. The pledge alone, of course, does not solve the problem. But we hope these funds will be quickly dispersed on similar terms as past years, which reflect global best practices in humanitarian donorship, so that the programmes I've described can continue. I also want to acknowledge the concerns donors have expressed over restrictions on humanitarian aid, particularly in the North. As I've said, we share these concerns and we continue to work tirelessly to address them. There has been some progress, but more is needed. We understand that all humanitarian funding is provided on a voluntary basis, and many countries are facing economic downturns at home. I want again to thank all our donors for their support. At the same time, we must all acknowledge the extraordinary threat Yemen is facing. So far, we've received about $800 million in pledges and contributions for the response this year. At this time last year, the equivalent figure was more than three times higher, about $2.6 billion. So I'm urging all donors to pledge generously now and immediately release at least enough money to cover response operations through July. For operations beyond July, we understand that some donors may choose to disperse the remainder of their pledges only after observing future developments. Despite conditions on the ground and the real threat to our staff's safety and health, we are staying and delivering. Some international staff were rotated outside Yemen when the airport was closed several weeks ago. The rest remain in country and are working with their Yemeni colleagues to deliver critical aid programs during this difficult time. We have enough staff in the country to deliver critical programs. What we don't have is the money. Mr. President, the fourth issue is the economy. Yemen imports nearly everything. Commercial cargo is still entering the country despite increased scrutiny to reduce the risk of COVID-19. In March, commercial food and fuel imports into Hodeida and Salif fell by 9%. That is a matter of concern, but the reduction is within normal fluctuations. Longer term economic prospects are more alarming. Imports have to be purchased in hard currency which means the government needs foreign exchange to finance them. And to afford those imports, people need the Yemeni rial to maintain a reasonable exchange rate. 
the impact of COVID-19 on the global economy will make this more difficult. Oil prices have fallen. Because the government depends on oil as a main source of revenue, officials may soon find it much harder to finance imports, to pay civil servant salaries, or to support the exchange rate. Rapid uncontrolled currency depreciation was a key factor in bringing Yemen to the brink of widespread famine 18 months ago. The World Bank warns that a similar risk of currency collapse persists today. In the past, remittances have served as a last defense for millions of vulnerable families. Economists estimate that Yemenis abroad send home more than $3 billion a year, making remittances the largest source of hard currency in local markets. But COVID-19 is affecting the economies where expatriate Yemenis work. A group of Yemeni economists and private sector leaders recently projected that remittances could drop by as much as 70% in the coming months. This would place us in uncharted territory. We need bold action to stabilize the economy before it's too late. This should include regular foreign exchange injections that have proved effective in the past, as well as doing whatever we can to increase quantities of affordable food and other consumer goods in markets across Yemen right now. Mr. President, my final point is progress towards peace. Martin has briefed you on that. Millions of Yemenis have suffered through years of war and deprivation. COVID-19 is presenting a unique opportunity to reinvigorate the political process and move towards peace. It is though also promising severe repercussions if that does not happen. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mark, for your, <clears throat> for your briefing. This concludes the live broadcast portion of this meeting.